Uh, first, I have, of course have to acknowledge a number of, uh, of, of funding agencies. Most of our money comes actually from Europe through a number of FED grants or uh, the Atom uh, QT cost grant that we had for what for to coordinate uh, matter wave uh, physics atom quantum technologies uh, throughout Europe. Uh, we are also doing a quite a bit with space nowadays. So from ESA, we have had a, a few grants to develop some of the technology. So the outlook of, outlook of my talk will be uh, what are matter waves, why matter waves, how and how do we do it, and also who are we. So starting with uh, matter waves. So uh, what are matter waves and why matter waves? So when we speak about matter waves, we are talking about not about waves making ma matter, so not waves made of matter, so not waves, ocean waves or so forth, but where the atoms themselves are waves or the particles themselves are waves. So it's the famous particle wave duality that plays here and we are, want to exploit and explore this very wave nature of, of really anything. So if we just look at it uh, simply, so if we, if we start with one atom in, uh, in front of a, of a slit, double slit, so this could be wave light, this could be atoms, but we have first somewhere where the position is very well defined. So uh, since the position is very well defined, the momentum isn't defined, so the waves spread out they hit a second point where the two positions, two positions are defined so that this wave goes through both of these positions uh, at the same time. And then at some other point, the waves again coalesce and we find uh, they interfere. Now, this works on the single, single particle level. So this could be one particle or it could be many. So in practice, when we do this experiment, we always have some source of particles, uh, then or waves, right? Um, which also defines the first slit. Then it passes through the two slits, and then we have some screen. And on that screen, we then detect dots because when we detect part, when we detect in the end, we always detect particles. Um, so it passes. There can be a few particles, and if it's just a few, I don't gain much information. But if I have many, then I start to see this, this interference pattern, which can be in time or in space or whatever. Um, so what determines what there is? Well, there are some points where the atoms are in phase, where these waves are in phase. That is where this part here, the one path and the other path interfere constructively and other places where they're out of phase. So where they're 90 degrees, uh, 180 degrees out of phase. And this has been demonstrated in many, many, many different ways with electrons, with, with atoms, with neutrons, and even with big molecules. So just to, to choose an extreme example, here is one of the most extreme that we have. So it's a gigantic molecule with a 2,000 molecular uh, weight, uh, 2,000 atoms with a molecular weight of 25,000 Dalton, that is every atom, uh, every molecule, every particle that you interfere contains about 25,000 neutrons or protons and the corresponding number of electrons with a gigantic uh, funny structure. And these atoms, these molecules are first generated, then pass through, well, these two together are one slit, then a multiple slit, and uh, afterwards they pass through an interference grating and are then being detected. And then we can see a very nice, very, very clear interference pattern between them. So even gigantic particles can still interfere and can still produce an interference pattern. Another example where we can see the, the matter wave uh, as, a, as, as a wave is in a Bose-Einstein condensate. So this picture here is a famous, is the famous picture from uh, Ketterle. <laughs> more or less for the pictures he received his Nobel Prize. No, I mean, yeah. Um, and what you can see, there's some thermal cloud, and as I call the thermal cloud further down, there's this spike here, this spike, and that is really the Bose-Einstein condensate. And in a Bose-Einstein condensate, each atom is everywhere at the same time. So it's, it's, analog it's completely analogous to, an, to a laser, where if the laser is, 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 is monochromatic, 
then each photon is any, everywhere along the laser at the same time. Only in this case, it's particles and they're not moving, then they stay in one place. And this can even be pushed to absolute extremes. So here on the right hand side, you can see a, a Bose-Einstein condensate that has spread, that has been released from a trap and then fell in a 100 meter tall tower for almost one second or for one second actually. And it was expanding during that time. And so this Bose-Einstein condensate is here in this case here is two millimeters long. And this is uh, to my knowledge, the, the largest Bose-Einstein condensate that we've seen. And again, each atom is everywhere in this region at the same time. Before we detect it, of course. The moment you detect it, you detect an atom, it has a well-defined place. But before you detect it, the, each atom is everywhere uh, at the same time. And I'll show you in a moment how we know that this, this must be true. Uh, in this case here on the left, that's from our laboratory. It's sort of our claim to fame is that we can make these matter wave rings. And this ring here has a, a radius of about one uh, millimeter and hence 6.3 6 millimeters uh, circumference. And again, each atom is everywhere in the ring at the same time. So this must be, I guess, I don't know for sure, but this must be one of the largest uh, uh, smearing of an atom that we, that we have. So, yeah. Um, so how do we know that they're everywhere? Well, let's return to one of the original works of, of Ketterle. And this is this here. So this is now, here he has taken two of these condensates, one on the left, one on the right, and then he has released them. As he released them, each one of them starts to expand and these clouds start to overlap. And as they overlap, I get interference fringes. Why do I get interference fringes? Because I know that the atoms are coming from one side, they're coming from the other side, so they have a velocity from these two sides, depending on how long I wait, of course. And they interfere, and depending on the position, we get fringes. And these very, very clear fringes that you can here, see here can only occur if there's coherence throughout the condensate. Otherwise, there would just be a blob because each atom would be on the left, would be incoherent with the right, and they would just, they would, there wouldn't be any interference. So I think this, the question of are these, are there, what are matter waves and are these really waves can be answered very nicely by, well, yes, of course there are waves and they're real waves. And these are not, these are waves. The atom itself is a wave. And we can also make waves which are coherent like a laser. And then we can start to manipulate them. And because they're waves, they obey very similar equations to the optics equations, only that they are stronger interacting than light normally would be. And so we can manipulate them just like waves. So how do we get these waves? Well, I'm not going, I don't think I should go into much detail here, but it's, it's a long path to get to BEC. You start with a gas of, of, of alkali atoms, in our case in rubidium, like many laboratories work on rubidium because of its atomic properties, it's, it's something we can use very nicely, very easily. Then this gas uh, gets cooled down, first using uh, lasers and magnetic fields to create an atomic beam. Then this beam gets cooled down further in a, in a three-dimensional trap. So it's laser beams coming from all directions and the magnetic field. And there we can already reach of the order of 100 microkelvin. So it's an enormous drop. That's uh, two, uh, three and a half orders of magnitude. Uh, then we put them into a magnetic trap. We compress them a bit and then we evaporate. And the evaporation is actually exactly the same that you do every morning with your coffee cup. I mean, I don't know whether you ever wondered about it, but it, 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 it is a strange thing. You have your coffee in your mug. I should have wanted to demonstrate it, but I don't. So you have a coffee in your mug. You, it, it has what has 100, grad, 100 degrees centigrade, very hot. You place it on the table. You go and brush your, you, you, you have a quick shower. You come back, it's cold. And it has dropped down to room temperature. Okay, let's assume you're sitting in a cold room, so it's about almost zero degrees. So it drops from 400 Kelvin to 300 Kelvin, right? So it, it loses one quarter of its kinetic energy. And you wonder how that can be. Well, you know, if you put a lid on it, it drops much more slowly. So clearly it is evaporation. 
evaporation comes from atoms or molecules in this case, leaving the water. And these molecules are having a much, much higher energy than the average energy in the, in, in the, in the water. Why? Because of surface tension. So inside it can move, but to get out, it has to overcome this very large barrier. So it takes along much more energy, so it cools down more rapidly. And this is why in the morning, where even though it drops by one quarter of its kinetic energy, there's just a tiny bit of water missing. Um, I live now in the, in the south of Europe, where it's very warm, and uh, so it's good that I need very little sweat in order to, to cool myself down. However, uh, okay, so, so then we drop, we lose atoms, but we can drop from 10 to the eight atoms to 10 to the six atoms, going from one milli Kelvin to one micro Kelvin. And so at one micro Kelvin, now we get Bose-Einstein condensation. And what happens there is that since I have cooled down the atoms to enormously low temperatures, I know the kinetic energy, it is the thermal energy. And if I know the kinetic energy, I know the velocity. But if I know the velocity, that means I cannot know its position very precisely. And so at, at some point, the position uncertainty will be larger than the interparticle distance, the average interparticle distance. And when I say uncertainty, that's actually in English, it's a, it's a misnomer. Uh, the proper, in German, we, sagen, uh, we, we say unschärfe. Unschärfe is fuzziness. So it's, it's not uncertainty, it's fuzziness, because the atom actually gets spread over that distance. So, and if this atom spread is larger than the interparticle distance, then there's no point anymore to speak of individual particles, but they all turn into one thing. And then nonlinear effects make that they all become one coherent wave, where the quantum state is described by the particle number and the wave, not anymore by individual wave functions of the atoms. And with that, I can then start to manipulate. I can make my rings. I can do whatever one feels like. And in the end, you take a picture. You take a picture by just throwing a shadow a shining light onto the atoms, which then creates a shadow. And that shadow I can detect. And then I can, again, do a beautiful 3D plot. And you can see the nice Gaussian background, which is the thermal gaps, and this parabola in the middle, uh, which is the BAC. And this is the, I'm very proud of that image because uh, it is the Laser Lab Europe allowed us to create the first BAC in south, Southeastern Europe. Actually, the first cold atom experiment in Southeastern Europe, but it's also the first BAC. And that was that picture is actually from within two days of the first time that we managed. It's maybe it's BAC number three or something like that. But all of that comes at a very high price. And the price is you have an incredibly difficult experiment to run. And I'm going to show you the, an optical table. Uh, well, actually, it doesn't advance. I don't know why. So here. Um, I'll show you an optical table of a BSC experiment of Emanuel Bloch in, 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 in Munich. Uh, it looks like a storage place for optics. It isn't. Every single mirror has a meaning. If you turn one of these screws by 10 degrees, the experiment is gone. And it, ha it has to be realigned. So th this, is, this is terrible. Uh, other things are the computer control, vacuum, there's many, many difficulties. So that begs the question, why? Why meta waves? Why go through this trouble? And the reason is, okay, A, it's, it's, it's a really beautiful object. I mean, that you have, that you can distribute atoms over large distances, that you can create a massive, a million atoms in one and the same quantum state, that you can interfere, it. That, that's beautiful in itself. But there's another reason. And that lies in quantum mechanics itself. So we know that um, h bar omega is, uh, is E, the energy is h bar omega. If you reshuffle that, then you see that, and, and you take into account that the frequency omega is the derivative of the phase. So if you integrate over E over h bar, you get the phase. So now, if I look at this, so what, what happens if I take one atom, I split it into two, and put it in a gravitational potential. Just in, on the rest, plop, I split it into two, and then the atoms, uh, the atoms have, a, one is higher up, one is further down. Let's say by height delta, by height h. Then I can calculate the energy that it has. Well, it is just mgh, right? So, and then I can calculate for a distance of just one nanometer, 
and one second, then I get a phase shift of pi, which means I get a huge signal for just a one nanometer difference in gravitational potential on Earth. So in other words, why matter waves? Well, because I can measure things, because I can measure things with extreme precision. And the tool for that is this matter wave interferometry. So if I have these two, I can send my atoms through there and I can calculate this phase and I find, yeah, that's what I, what I just told you, that the, the height differences just uh, comes from this. So uh, how do I do that in the experiments? What, how do I split the atoms into two? Well, you use a standing wave pattern. So one of the beautiful things with matter wave optics is that everything is reserved, reversed. What normally is the mirror, which is a physical object, in our case, is the light. What is normally the light is now the particles. We can make lenses, which are magnetic potentials. We can make beam splitters. And in this case, if, yeah, in, in beam splitters, gratings in this case. So we can make a grating by retroreflecting a laser beam. And then when the atoms go in there, they can get split into momentum. One picks up two momenta, one doesn't, and then it's being reversed and so forth. And so you can make a nice interferometer with that. And these interferometers can be used as accelerometers. So it measures acceleration or just gravitational potential, which are, of course, uh, in, um, uh, the same thing. And then I can have a look. So then in, this is like a plot of what happened over time. In 1980, it was still pretty miserable, 10 to minus 4. The commercial gravimeters, actually, they are, they are basically stuck at 10 to the minus 9. But then through time, atom interferometers have beaten them by a lot. And now we are at the 10 to the minus 14 levels or getting to the 10 to the minus 14 levels. However, these experiments are huge. It's a huge effort uh, I, because in order to measure the, the, this, this high precision, you need to wait for a long time because the beam splitter splits in velocity space. The atoms go apart, so distance increases. The integral over time then gives me a t squared dependence, so with a square of time. But that means I have to wait for a second. But at the same time, the atoms fall. So the, 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 uh, in order to get a good contrast, I need to let them fall for about a second or go with high sensitivity to fall, fall for one second. And so I need, I need to have an experiment where I can drop the atoms for one second. So either I built a gigantic uh, vacuum tube, shielded rock vacuum tube, like in Stanford, an eight meter tall, or I take an experiment, build a small experiment, drop down a huge vacuum tube, 120 meters, like at the Zahn drop tower in Germany, or maybe I take a plane, this is the zero G plane, the vomit comet, so-called, for what happens to PhD students in there, who run the experiments in there. Um, or rockets that go into space, or actually go into the space station, or onto, onto dedicated satellites. And uh, my research group is involved in a number of aspects there. So there's also ELGA, which is a huge interferometer, 20 kilometers long with 60 inter atom interferometers linked through an optical cavity to in, uh, in order to get gravitational wave uh, detection. Uh, that's a proposal which we're working on. SDE Quest is already selected for phase two as a satellite, which looks at how differentially how atoms drop. Uh, EDGE is a, a gravitational wave interferometer in space, also a proposal. SAGE is an atom clock experiment and so forth. So um, why matter waves? Why the pain? Well, you've seen it partially. I mean, you've seen that we can get this precision, but why do we want this precision? Well, so let me give you as a motivation a, a, a small little story. In 1951, a flight from Stockholm to Japan took 55 hours, a long time. After a few years, it took only 35 hours. So how did they shave off within two or three years, 20 hours in flight time? Hard to see. The planes didn't get, get that much faster. They didn't double in speed. No, the reason is because the fastest route between Stockholm and Japan goes over the North Pole. But how do you get over the North Pole? If you're on a small plane, if you're in a plane on the North Pole that flies a little bit low, then you might have cloud cover above you. You don't see the stars. 
and you look down, you see white something. So you lose orientation, you fly a little circle, you die. So, but Anna Pedersen invented a precise and portable gyroscope. Apparently that's what he's looking at in there. So with that gyroscope, suddenly it was safe to fly over the pole. So it shaved to uh, almost half the flight time. You didn't have to fly around the pole, you could fly over it. So navigation improves if I can measure precisely. Another example. Uh, what you see there is the famous uh, Earth potato, which is the gravitational mass of Earth. So this is hugely important nowadays because it allows us to see where's water missing, where, where used to be water, where isn't any. Are the oceans heating? Is the, uh, uh, is the deep water expanding because of heat? Are the poles caps uh, melting? Well, all of this is right now me measured by, by missions like the GRACE mission. And uh, from, from space, because only from space you can see the whole of Earth. And, uh, but these missions are running out of steam because they depend on certain um, on gravi classical gravimeters. And these are prone to drift. And so it becomes very difficult to measure this with higher precision. So that's why ESA and the European Union have selected, uh, have this, this selected that. I'm terribly sorry about that. Oops. Um, have selected, um, sorry, have selected uh, cold atoms as a means to measure the gravitational potential of Earth. So the European Union has financed now a, a, a test project for this, and the and ESA is thinking about that. And, uh, yeah, and we are part of the of of, of this project. Uh, another thing that you can do is you can measure fundamental physics. You can look at, of course, what happens to quantum mechanics. That's, that's a very interesting thing to look at. But what you can also do is you can, uh, I mean, quantum mechanics, the limits of quantum mechanics, that is, how long can a superposition live? How long can I make atoms live in separate places at the same time? But another question is general relativity. So Einstein's weak equivalence principle tells us what Galileo believed in, that if I let two masses fall, if they're bigger, they will just fall onto the floor. They will, uh, they will be accelerated at the same speed. Um, and so this is what we're going to test in this experiment, SD Quest, which is a mission proposal, which has just been selected for phase two. And we are going to put rubidium and potassium into space, accelerate them and measure differential ac uh, um, acceleration in free fall. So the two masses will be falling and we will see whether one is accelerated relative to the other. And because we can compare two masses, we can measure the differential acceleration with enormous precision, hopefully down to the minus, uh, to the 10 to the minus 17 level. Good. But these are all things that, um, that, that are happening in general. But I also would like to speak to you a little bit more about what's happening uh, on Crete in our group. And uh, as you can, as Crete, Crete is in Greece, and in Greece I cannot easily find funding to make my, to drop uh, an, um, to drop a mass, to make a huge tower, to make gigantic experiments. So I, I have to go to a lowest, smaller scale. But also, it's not, uh, it would be interesting to go to a smaller scale to, in order to measure, uh, to make useful devices for archaeology, to measure uh, holes in the ground and so forth. So this is, this is why we're focused on, uh, on atomtronics, on small scale experiment that you can actually do in the lab. So a uh, small overview, who, where, what? Who are we? Where are we? What are we doing? So first of all, of course, the most important thing, the guys in the lab, the people who actually do the experiment. And uh, the leading postdoc right now is Vishnu Priya. Um, uh, and Yanis is a postdoc in the experiment. Pandora, Mary, and Vine are working more on uh, classical optics, space optics supporting technologies. Dimitris Papadopoulos is a theorist for optics. Kostas Makris is also a theorist for nonlinear optics. And Apostolos is a PhD student uh, of mine and Kostas working on, on, on meta waves. And of course, things go further in the back. 
in, in time. So Saurabh and Hector were PhD students, were finished now, uh, their PhDs uh, uh, a little while now. Uh, Saurabh is at JPL, still working on BSD and uh, interferometry, and Hector is at UCLA, also as a postdoc there. Uh, and uh, well, you see the guy in the top corner. So if you, I couldn't find a scientist as a male or female, doesn't matter, of course. But if you are interested in working on this sort of a thing, we have positions and we're really, we have a Marie Curie post, uh, PhD position open and other positions, and we're looking for people. So if you know someone, please do tell us. Which brings us to the where. Well, where's there? Where's nice? Where's creaked at 40 degrees? Well, 27 on the further on the beach, 19 degrees in the sea, and minus 273.1499992 degrees in the lab, eight nano Um So it's a nice place to be, just as part of the advertisement. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the eight nano Kelvin in a moment. So as I mentioned, uh, we're interested in atomtronics. And I'm going to give you a nice definition of that in a moment. We make these are guided matter wave potentials, which we have found a new way to do that. And I've mentioned these, these experiments here, which we are involved in, in planning. So we're part of the science core team, as they call it. And this is some of the uh, technology that we've made for these satellites. So there's particular laser distribution related problems that we're taking care of and that ESA, together with ESA for these projects. Good, atomtronics. Atomtronics is the dream of taking atoms and moving them around. I had mentioned that for the big experiments, we need to have long drop times. So there the idea is, no, rather than letting them drop, I hold them, I manipulate them, and I move them around. I make these junctions and bring the atoms from one place to another, overlap them, and then I can measure things. So it's a little bit like that, right? So we want to have these, we want to, our atoms being the train, being able to move on two tracks at the same time. And uh, so that's the idea. However, unfortunately, reality looks a little bit different. Reality looks more like that. So if you try to make a track for atoms, and if you make it, such that the track defines where the atoms go, right? then any imperfection in the track, it doesn't matter how small they are, any imperfection in the track will be reflected in the magnetic, the potential that you create with these tracks. So what people do is they use wires, for example, to lay down, lay down on atom chips. And these wires then create the magnetic potential. And that magnetic potential is, is then a guide for the atoms. Now, if these, if these wires have any imperfections, then the potential has imperfection. And as the atoms go along the track, if they move along the track, then their forwards motion get coupled to the sideways motion. That's why when you travel in a train, unfortunately, you cannot put your champagne glass on the table and hope that the champagne stays in there, right? It gets shaked, shaken out of it. And the train slowed down a little bit in the process. Not noticeably, but still. But what we want is this, right? We want is a straight track. So how do we do that? Well, we want the magnetic po the potential to be straight. The track, who cares? And then there's the wonderful little formula that uh, Chris Foot has uh, come up with in, in 2004 in Jones, which tells us that any roughness of any wire distribution drops exponentially with k times z, where k is the length the length vector, the size vector, typical one over the typical size of this fluctuations times z. So it drops off very, very quickly. So what we need is a shape change of paradigm because we need to be able to, uh, to get somehow my, there we are. We need a change of paradigm. We need to get away from defining the tracks with how the wires are because if, the, if this, this, this fluctuations drop with exponentially, so does the control. So I cannot use the control. I cannot control and soon be smooth at the same time. So I need a change of paradigm. And this change of paradigms to get away from the tracks defining it 
and using, uh, manipulating the atoms in energy space, making something like a quadrupole trap. If I have a quadrupole, magnetic quadrupole, a magnetic quadrupole is basically always perfect because it's a, it's a fundamental, it's a fundamental concept. A loop, two counter propagating loops in the center will make a beautiful uh, quadrupole uh, potential. So if I now can define what my waveguides in energy space, then I can make them uh, as a perfectly smooth object. Um, so if I, if I now, what we do in the lab is we have different energy scales, time scales, so the repetition of an experiment typically is on the order of one at uh, 10 seconds. We manipulate the atoms on a time scale of one second. And then we can uh, jumping away, we can time average. So if we move something fast compared to the, uh, so fast that the atoms cannot follow, but that they still see the potential, then they see an average of that potential. That's time averaging. We can also induce spin flips. We can use uh, uh, so magnetic spin flips or hyperfine spin flips, and then we can shine light into it for detection. But by taking these four here together, and unfortunately, I don't have time, or I want to spare the non-specialists of you uh, the, the exact explanation of how that works. But if you want to, I can, in the question time, I can explain it in more detail how this works. But the upshot of, 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 of the combining all of this is that I can make first, just using the quadrupole and the, uh, and the magnetic spin flips, I can make an eggshell. And this is, this is actually being tried in the space station. They want to make perfect shells and then send vortices and then play with the matter wave in a shell shape. On Earth though, the atoms are being pulled to the bottom. So then it behaves just like a, just looks like a dish. But this doesn't help me because it's not a track. It's not, I can't manipulate atoms in there easily. So what I then can do is by shaking this bubble up and down, I can force the atoms to go on the rim of the ball, of, of, this, of this ball, of this ball. And so it creates a wave shape, a wave guide shaped object. And if I shake in different patterns, then I can make all sorts of objects. And these are equal potential surfaces of various things that one can create. But the most important thing is in the middle. I can make a ring, an almost perfect ring, a perfectly smooth ring, and maybe even multiple rings because uh, by using multiple radio frequencies. But the most important thing is we can actually make it in reality. So this here is now an absorption image, so a real shadow image of a BAC, a Bose-Einstein condensate in a ring with 300,000 atoms in there at about 10 nano Kelvin with the diameter of uh, two millimeters. And as a matter of fact, we can make all sorts of shapes. So here's a ring, a, a nice flat ring. Here's a waveguide where we shoot some atoms through there, which leave a comet trail. Then we can, uh, we can tilt the ring a little bit so that the atoms collect on one side only. We can use uh, different spins, spin states. And we, so we can do a lot of manipulation in that. But, um, and this can be used to, to make an interferometer in the ring. And we've demonstrated this interferometer in the, in the shell trap already. So um, what can we do with that? So, okay, we first make the, make the BSC and then we put it in the ring. And this is now the BSC, but how do we know it's a BSC? Well, if you make your cut through the BSC, now on one side of the ring only, then you can see, well, this is a fit of a parabola, which is the BSC with a background, which is a Gaussian. So there's a Gaussian below, parabola above. So it's a BSC, we're sure of it. And uh, we can also make the BSC fill the whole of the ring, but okay. And then we accelerate. And when we accelerate, we use the famous bang bang scheme of, optical, of, of optimal control uh, theory. And I'm going to be very, very daring, which I'm going, probably going to regret but I'm going to switch off the camera, the, the shared screen for a moment and to the camera. And I hope that you can still hear me because I've brought you along a little rubidium atom to demonstrate to you how the bang bang scheme works. So rubidium is red, right? So that's our rubidium atom and it's in a harmonic trap. So along the ring, we have a, we, we can superimpose a harmonic trap, how? 
we can tilt the ring. And so a tilted ring in energy space, or vertical is energy, a tilted ring is lower in energy on one side and locally it's like a harmonic trap. So we have harmonic trap. So harmonic trap is just my atom in a string, right? So, but now the challenge is how do I move the atom? How do I accelerate the atom quickly? And so what I want to do is I want to accelerate it. So how do I do that? But if I, if I, if I just try to accelerate, then the atom will oscillate, right? So it will excite the atom and I will have excitation. It's very hard then to control the whole, the, uh, what happens to the atom. What I want is I want to control. So I want to be able to, to accelerate it without exciting a harmonic oscillation inside this moving trap. So how do I do that? Well, what I can do is I can look at what happens. So if I accelerate suddenly, then the atom starts to oscillate in this trap, right? But if I now accelerate suddenly uh, or move the trap suddenly forward, but rather than letting it move forward, I accelerate still, then I can balance the force that tries to make the atom oscillate. I can balance by the acceleration. And so I can accelerate very fast uh, forward. And then what I can do is once I reach the velocity that I want, I just stop accelerating at the same time, jump to the thing. So then in the moving frame, I'm in the, in, 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 again, in the bottom of the trap. So to demonstrate you, so if I want to move from here, let's say, uh, and then afterwards I do the inverse, I jump the trap backwards, I slow down and then jump back into position, right? So to demonstrate here that it really works, it's I move forward, oops, here. I can move it, so I can move it back from here to here without exciting almost any motion. So, so it really works. And uh, as a matter of fact, of course, I mean, we didn't invent that. That was published in this, uh, in this, uh, let me, sorry. Yeah, share my backdrop and hopefully find my, pop. good, yes, yeah. So um, this has been predicted in, the, in this paper, the bang, and named the bang bang scheme of optimal control theory. But if there's any crane <laughs> operators amongst you, then you know this trick because every, every crane operator in this world knows that train, uh, that trick, because that's how you move a big mass on a long string across the building side. However, here it really works. So if you now look at, at this here, you see the atom, that's the atom that's already accelerated moving around and I can go faster. You can see it, well, probably in zoom it's, <laughs> oh God, it's even going backwards, but never mind. Um, so movies really don't work in, in Zoom. But this is now the, the position of the atoms as they move along the ring. And because, I mean, I can show that, okay, here's the BSC. So we start down here at zero time in the BSC. And four and a half seconds later, you can still see the characteristic dome-shaped structure with a Gaussian background. You see the Gaussian background has become a lot larger, but that would happen anyway. A BSC doesn't live very long. It gets heated anyway. And we can see zero difference between it being static or having been accelerated. So we can move it really, really very fast over enormous distances without any additional heating. And okay, I can look at the, if I look in here, what happens and I subtract the line, then I do get some residual motion, but this has, uh, this is very, very small. So you can see here, it's about a, uh, uh, 100, 100 milli radians compared to 800 radians that, that we're moving. And the reason for it is a different one. It's not exactly that we're not doing this perfect. Now, uh, some of you will say, ah, but it's no surprise. I know that atoms can, that the condensate can move uh, in this system without getting heated. It's a superfluid. Superfluids do not get heated. They're superfluid. But actually, I can calculate the, the maximum superfluid velocity. Above that velocity, a superfluid isn't a superfluid anymore, but a normal fluid. And that velocity is about two millimeters per second. But we are moving 17 times that speed. So these atoms, this BSC is moving at set max 17 through this, through this waveguide, which it shouldn't be able to do because it should just boil away from 
the train where I'm shaking the atoms out of, out of the track. But that doesn't happen because it is perfectly smooth. There is no, there is no, uh, there is no roughness. Nothing can, um, nothing is shaking it. And the reason is, again, this paradigm shift that I told you, I'm not defining the tracks by some geometric wires being put somewhere. It is defined by a quadrupole and by radio frequency that shine into it. It has to be circular. There's, there's no way to, that I can put any roughness onto it using magnetic fields. And hence, if something, I mean, if something is perfect, then yeah, it is, if, if, if I cannot put anything rough on principle on it, then it will be smooth. And if you can do something that's, uh, that is perfect, then yeah, you can publish it nicely. And we've published it in Nature in, in 2019. Now, this is actually the, the place where it all happens, right? So on the left-hand side, you can see here this aluminum thing that you see here is our, this is where we generate a cold atom boom, which shoots into a vacuum system, which sits inside all of these coils here. And in the very middle here, you can then see in, in there, we, we, we generate the BAC and the ring and so forth. And these, uh, the, these coils, the outside coils here, they generate the oscillating fields. And, and inside here is a big quadrupole coil which, with 400 amps, which creates the, the quadrupole field. Now, if we look, compare the sizes, my ring is about point, this one here is 0.5 millimeters in diameter. The coils are about 50 millimeters uh, away. And then I can calculate using the formula that I mentioned to you earlier, how much any roughness in the, out here would be suppressed by. And then I can calculate K times Z. That's the roughly the radius of the ring. So it's something like this here. Times the, so K times Z is about 630. Plug it into the formula and you get 10 to the minus 275. So any roughness in the coils is suppressed by 10 to the minus 275. That's of course a ridiculous number. There is no such number in physics. But what it just tells you is it just doesn't exist. The other effects which play a role infinitely before that. So, with other words, this ring has to be smooth. It is a true change of paradigm and it works. Good, then I can look at what I can actually create in there. And if I have a moving wave, then I can uh, see this ring and I can fit to the ring. I can measure the roughness of or the, not the roughness, the modulation of the ring. And you can have a modulation of, of two phi or four phi, sorry, uh, phi or two phi, sine two phi around, along the ring. I can do a fit, I can calculate it, and then I can calculate the, the effective, um, effective energy that corresponds to this potential difference. And it's just two nanometers. So it's a 200 pico Kelvin. And that's really 200 nanometers over one millimeter effective height. That's enormously smooth. And at the same time, we can control these potentials with enormous precision. We can put the co-moving uh, potential, which means we can make tiny, tiny differences of the orders of tens of pico Kelvin. We can move uh, a sine wave along the ring and we can do experiments with that. And uh, what we can use it for is optimal control uh, atom optics. So we can look at, we can apply a lens, a co-moving lens with a system of a magnet, uh, gravitomagnetic lens. And we can then do optics and we can use that in order to reduce, to collimate a beam essentially. So what do you do first? Well, you first have to, uh, to focus your, your optics. So here we vary the strength of the lens and we look at the average kinetic energy of what comes out of it. And it's a bit busy, I'm afraid. Apologize for that. But the more important thing is this focus here that you get. And uh, here you can see different images of the cloud as it passes through this focus. And you can see it's a very nice focus. And then I can look at, uh, I can try to collimate the beam. So the dashed lines here, the red dashed line is a uh, the free thermal expanding, the thermal part freely expanding, and the blue dashed line is the Bose condensate freely expanding in the ring. You can see it really expands relatively quickly. Then I can look at the, then I can try to collimate it. And as I 
under the optimal collimation conditions that we found, we find that whereas before it was about 200 nanokelvin, it drops to 12 nanokelvin in kinetic energy, and the BSC goes from 37 nanokelvin to 8 nanokelvin. So this is kinetic energy equivalent temperature. So this is the energy that's stored actually in the uh, in the chemical potential in the atom atom interactions in the condensate, and it gets released. And this is what we what we collimated away. And then, I mean, if I compare the two, then this is a decrease in kinetic energy uh, by uh, a factor of uh, almost 50. So we can actually see it. So now on the left hand side, that's a cloud, that's the freely expanding cloud. On the right hand side, that is with this collimation lens. And if you let them run together, you can see that here, plus one gets really nicely, uh, uh, one expands a lot and one much less. So the much less expand is just a focus through the system. And then uh, what, we, what we measure is the, the 800 picokelvin energy. So I can measure that by, um, by looking at how far does it expand over a certain amount of time? Then I can measure the velocity, in this case, 400 micrometers per second. And I can translate that back to a temperature. Now, the 400 microseconds per second is, is it, it's significant because it's amongst the lowest temperatures anyone reaches in a laboratory. And certainly uh, amongst the absolute lowest temperatures that one can uh, achieve in in, in a tabletop experiment. But it's also significant in that we can measure it. Why? So 400 micrometers per second. To measure that expansion, you need time, right? If you let it drop for, four, for one second, right? And it drops many meters in one second. If you drop it for one second, it only increases in size by 400 micrometers. So the fact that we can actually measure this is pretty cool. It shows that in this ring, we can have a free expansion, we can manipulate atoms, we can let them move at least in one dimension freely, and we can use this tool as a matter wave optical tool to measure extremely low energies and, of course, manipulate them. So, um, it being 45 minutes, we're coming to the... Uh, let me just summarize uh, what, what, we, what I have told you about. Well, We've created a mini CERN, a mini accelerator ring for neutral atoms, uh, where we can accelerate and manipulate the atoms. We've done, uh, we have uh, done some atomtronics in there. We've uh, manipulated the beams. We've manipulated the atoms. We can uh, collimate the laser beams and so forth. We have demonstrated lossless hypersonic flow of BCs. So lossless in that it sees zero heating, there's no heating whatsoever. And the atoms propagate over very, very long distances. I didn't actually mention that, but uh, the previous record was just a few hundred micrometers. And now there's 40 centimeters that we can transport them without observing any loss of internal coherence. We've done matter wave optics. And now we would like to go to, uh, to do some matter wave bub bubbles. We would like to look at obstacles. So what happens if you, if, if you put a little bump into the waveguide? When do the atoms move? What determines uh, the heating? What are the limits of that? And so forth. And uh, as you've seen here in the top left corner, I would like to remind you that uh, maybe you, maybe a friend of yours is interested in swimming in the beaches and uh, having some adventures in the lab. Thank you very much indeed.